Hi, how are you? I'm uh, Todd McDevitt. I am a card-carrying engineer, uh, one of the ones that Sandy mentioned earlier. Um, and what I uh, want to focus on talk about is some of the stuff that uh, our lab has been particularly interested with regards to engineering tissues and where this comes from. Um, what you just heard from Kathy has been really transformative from the biology because we know so much more about the inner workings of cells, what makes cell cells. And it's been empowering for tissue engineers like myself because our starting source of material to be able to build tissue, we just have a much better knowledge base to work from. Um, that being said, and one thing that's motivating for us is, well, then why do we need to, you know, we just heard there's been tremendous advances from what we can already do in cell biology, but one thing to think about is that next level, that next strata of the biology and how cells interact with one another, um, are there ca the caveats that we have with current cell culture practices? So I'll point out a couple for the, the folks that uh, don't do this routinely. The first is that uh, as opposed to cells in this soft tissue sort of organism, we grow them on hard plastic flat surfaces um, outside of bodies. Um, they're grown oftentimes in isolation, so a single cell type, whereas in our bodies, these cells are in high density and mixed with one another. Um, they're grown in, in, in conditions with 20-fold oxygen. So the amount of oxygen that we take in, but inside our bodies, that's 20-fold more in the in air, in air in the environment than what actually cells see inside of our body. Um, and also, uh, to grow these cells normally, uh, we use various animal byproducts. A lot of them come from cows and other species. So all of that says that while we've been able to unmask much of the, the mysteries of the uh, cell biology and science, um, we've done so with uh, uh, a lot of tools and platforms that you know, are not as natural as what uh, the biology, particularly human biology, we're trying to study. Um, and so one of the goals from a tissue engineering is can we start to think of ways, maybe for model systems outside of our body, that we can construct and put cells in an environment that is more like, uh, it's not identical, but more like what they're akin to being or, or used to seeing or uh, more analogous, I guess, to this, the real situation. Um, and so some, anytime I talk about this that from a cell biology, there's also a new maybe uh, era emerging of multicellular biology because there's additional questions that build off of this. And as Sandy said, communication being a big part of that and how do cells go from individual cells to form tissues. Um, one of the things then from an engineering is you want to understand these mysteries. Well, one of the, a, a great quote that uh, I'll paraphrase because I don't want to inaccurately cite, but from Richard Feynman, a very famous physicist, was that which I uh, cannot create, I do not understand. So it implies inherently from it that if you really want to understand any system or anything, if you can put it together in a proper way and it functions or behaves like what you would expect, then you have at least a, a decent understanding of what that system, how it works. Um, and so from tissue engineering, that's one of our goals. If we can take cells, organize them, or construct them in the right way, that they start to behave like tissues, uh, that would mean that we now understand something better than we did. And that's a great experimental thing where we can look and see, well, what are the important factors to make, to make that happen? There's three, I'd say, important things that we uh, oftentimes try to focus on then. First is how do we get cells to be like tissues? How do we organize or assemble them in such a way to get to even start to uh, uh, venture into that space? Um, within that context, how do we effectively know that cells are communicating with one another? Can we detect, as, as Kelly said, there's great powerful molecular tools now that we can use to try and really understand how, where communication is occurring in these complex networks. Um, and we want to be able to embed that in our systems so that we can actually measure and detect that. Um, and that overall will hopefully lead then to this sort of higher level, this mystery of when is it that tissues start to exhibit these higher order functions. Uh, an individual cell, we might say, doesn't think on its own, but collections of cells in the brain, now you start to see higher order function that starts to manifest. When does that, mist where does that occur? What's that line that we cross or that threshold? Um, and if we wanted to be able to study that, What's in, a, in an environmentally or eco-friendly way, what's the minimal amount of unit that we need to study? We don't necessarily need a whole tissue or organ. Maybe we need a part of that that we can study in the lab and then we can also manufacture or make lots of those so we can do lots of experiments in parallel and still be able to understand the biology we're trying to study. So that sort of um, a paradigm, which is inherent to engineering, is sort of a design, build, and measure concept. 
and it doesn't stop. It's, it's sort of iterative. You get to the measure, and then you've realized what you've learned, and you go back to design again, and you do this over and over, and that's oftentimes how engineering has impacted many things, not just in biology, but in many industries, how you go from raw materials to refinement to actual new technologies, many of which we oftentimes don't anticipate at the start. The analogies I make with that are things like the petroleum, the pulp and paper, these other engineering industries. When you look at the raw crude materials they start with and the products or technologies that came out on the back end over oftentimes maybe many decades, that's I think where we can envision as well where we might as tissue engineers be able to take some of this information and, and take what looks very crude now and admittedly is, but actually have things that are, are good models and mimics and maybe even can serve directly as therapies in the future. Um, so the th three things then for us that are important is what are those raw materials? Well, one thing uh, for us that, that has been a game changer in particular over the last, for the field of tissue engineering, I'll speak for a second, uh, which is still considered by some an, a young field, 25 years old perhaps, uh, but really within the last 10 to 15 years, the uh, uh, embracement uh, or embracing of st stem cell sources in particular. Now we have a source that we can use for a variety of different uh, tissues to be able to create, and that was something that prior to the advances or the discoveries that were made with embryonic and then IPS, and subsequently the type of, uh, the ability to differentiate cells as Kathy just described, that's a game changer because now our, our toolbox, the Lego sets that we have, got a lot broader than what we used to have. The next part then has been to create these tissues, and that's where my lab in particular spends a lot of time. So we, wor we work and we work from stem cell sources. We're interested in then in how can we put these cells together in the appropriate or right way that they go on to form tissues. Um, one thing that's different about our approach compared to much of what's currently been done or historically been done in tissue engineering is the idea that you build the scaffold, the framework first. This is sort of uh, analogous to buildings. You put up all the, cons the framework first, and then you fill it in. That's not how tissues do it. You don't start with this framework of things and then cells just appear and get dumped on top of it. Biology actually starts with cells and they grow and they multiply and they form and they take shape over time and they construct the matrix as they need it. So that's a sort of different approach about the chicken and egg and what comes first. And we are trying to embrace more that biological approach and use the ability of cells to self-organize and assemble and then go on to morph or change into those uh, tissues. And that's what we're try trying to explore and examine, which has been an understudied or perhaps undervalued uh, approach, in my opinion, of how to go about trying to construct tissues. And the, th the third part then, as I mentioned, that's important is how do we know we have any success? You can look at things and it looks good, uh, but if you don't really test it for function, I would say, or measure it in a meaningful way, then you're, you're sort of mi missing out or you also don't know if you really are having success. Um, interestingly, what's, what uh, has been fun is in this arena in particular is that there are several or many um, tools that we can use, existing tools, to measure the, our, our level of success. But there's a lot of opportunities when we create something new like this that when we go to look for how do we test it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> And so then we sit there and scratch our head and we say, well, what, what happens next? And so fortunately, again, with a, a great diversity of team of, of, uh, uh, of engineers I've had in my own lab, but also the opportunities to collaborate with various investigators from many disciplines, this is when it gets really fun as well. And you bring this to them and start to think of new challenges and opportunities. So it's, a, again, to close that loop, it's important for us to kind of be active in all of those areas. Um, so I'll, I'll just conclude and mention and say, so why is, this important, or why is this important? I think you can probably pick up from what uh, uh, Kathy just said from this. If we can manufacture tissues, then we can start to think about studying diseases from those cells and think also about environmental factors that we know are equ as, as important or also work with the genetics of these diseases and epigenetics. And we can actually engineer environments that maybe control or, or manipulate those epigenetics. And then we can study those interactions in new ways. Um, so those are the things for us that is a lab scientifically, and we work across actually largely cardiac, but also other tissue sources. And this is also so we can extract general principles and see how consistently they are applied across different tissue and organ systems. Um, so one of the examples we'll have in the outside is actually a really fantastic postdoc that I've been fortunate enough to work with for the last several years, um, Tracy, who actually has some great visual demonstrations. Her, her work is, is great in that regard of this whole loop about how she's going about building cardiac tissues, how she's going about assessing those, and then what she's trying to do with those. So uh, I encourage you to take the time to talk with her because she'll do even a much better job than I can. So thank you very much.